Well, I wonder what you're most thankful about. If I was to ask you, what are the things that you're most thankful about? Would you have a long list? I do hope that you're thankful about many things. Uh, I've been hearing even this morning about uh, fun times that people have been having, perhaps with uh, grandchildren or uh, going on outings and, and things that you've been able to see and do. But I hope that you're thankful for our, our beautiful nation and, and peaceful nation where we live. I do hope that you can be thankful for family and for friends and for the material blessings that we uh, have that allow most of us to live in, in comfort and particularly compared to the rest of the world in great comfort. But I wonder how often we think about the most significant thing that we have to be thankful for. The thing which perhaps is the most important thing and that is of course what God has done for us in saving us and forgiving our sins. I wonder if we, we sometimes forget to think about that one. And we don't reflect very often on just how significant that is, on how big a thing it really is that God, the God of the universe, our creator, that we have rebelled against, forgives our sins. Because I think uh, if we do stop and reflect on that, and perhaps the more that we stop and reflect on that, I think it will make a big difference to our relationship with God and to how much we love him. And as a consequence, then, how we live for him in the world. And we see that, I think, uh, and we're reminded of that in the passage that we're looking at today from Luke chapter 7, uh, starting at verse 36 there. And thanks to Valerie for reading that for us. And we see that uh, here Luke tells us, again, of Jesus ministering in the area around Galilee. Is, that's where he's been in the passage before there. He doesn't tell us exactly which town Jesus is in, but uh, somewhere in Galilee, perhaps back in the capital city of Capernaum, where he has a dinner invitation from one of the most respected men in the town, a man named Simon, who was a religious leader of the group of the Pharisees who are really the religious leaders in Israel, the ones who uh, were pushing perhaps most for the Jews to be faithful to God's law. At least they definitely wanted people to be seen to be doing the right thing. No doubt Simon had heard about Jesus, about the amazing things that Jesus had been doing, especially the miraculous healings, casting out demons, even raising a man, a young man from the dead as he was on his way to be taken for burial. Now, to, to understand what happens next at this dinner party, we need to know something about how formal dinners were done in the ancient world, at least in this Roman style, uh, which is what it seems to be. And it seems that uh, diners would recline with their heads toward a central table, with their feet facing towards the outside wall, so that those who were the, the focus of the, uh, the, the dinner party could work, had their heads close enough to each other to be able to, uh, to chat and so on. But the servants, I guess, could, could come and go and, and replace the, uh, the food on the table and so on. And what might seem a kind of weird thing to us is that visitors were often allowed at these sorts of meals people who weren't invited to part, take, uh, take part in it were allowed to come and as long as they stood around the walls. And it's interesting that that uh, apparently was also the case in the Middle Ages and, and even uh, into the period after that uh, in various parts of the world. We went to a uh, castle in Germany and they explained that this is where the, the royal folks sat and chatted and the court and then lots of people were allowed to be around the outside. Seems that was the case uh, back in those days as well. So it's not unusual to have visitors at a meal. But the one that Luke goes on to mention perhaps was unexpected at this particular meal. You see, uh, it was a woman, but not just any woman, we're told in verse 37, there was a woman in that town who lived a sinful life. That Jesus was, uh, she learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. 
The woman who's li living a sinful life, um, it's often assumed that she was a prostitute or something like that. doesn't have to be. There could have been any number of other reasons that she was considered to be a sinful woman. The point is that she just was known uh, to be someone who was not living in a way that uh, would impress the religious authorities. But she learned that Jesus was having dinner at this particular home and thinking, well, I should be able to get in there. She has a plan, and her plan involves actually bringing a large jar of perfume. Uh, I assume it was large, but uh, we don't know exactly the size. The point is, it was actually in an alabaster jar, suggesting that it was really quite fancy to be in a jar that, that special. And what she does is quite remarkable because she stands behind Jesus at his feet, weeping. And she's just standing there weeping, so much it seems that her tears are falling on Jesus' feet. And you can imagine that uh, after a day walking around in the dusty roads of uh, Palestine or, or Galilee of the time, that Jesus' feet might have been pretty uh, grotty but her tears are such that she's able to wet his feet significantly with her tears. And then in a, a demonstration of her, I guess, affection towards Jesus, she actually wipes his feet with her hair. In the ancient world, uh, married women always apparently wore their hair up in, in these times, but uh, single women... Not so much. They could wear their hair out. But she takes her hair and wipes his feet. And as if that's not shocking enough, she then kisses his feet and pours perfume on him. What an incredible sign of honouring Jesus it is. But it's not just honouring him. I mean, she could have taken the perfume and poured it on his head uh, somewhere just, just would have been a remarkable enough thing in itself. But this is really a demonstration of her recognition of something really special, of who Jesus is, that he is someone that special. But it's her tears which suggest that really she's come to understand that Jesus has offered her something which she never thought she could have otherwise. And that is, Jesus offers her forgiveness of her sins, offers her a fresh start. And it seems that Jesus understands that himself. But before uh, Luke tells us about what Jesus understands about what the woman's doing, we get the interpretation of the, the Pharisee, the Pharisee who had invited Jesus to have dinner with him. And he's not too impressed with what the woman is doing. We see there in verse 39. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if, the, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. It seems that she was that well known around the town that... Uh, the Pharisee, Simon, recognises her and expects that Jesus would be able to tell, even if he's not from the same town. If he really is a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him, that she is a sinner. And apparently the Pharisee expects Jesus to disapprove of what she is doing and of just even of who she is. Now, we're, not, we're told that that is what Simon is thinking, not told necessarily that's what he said, but it seems that Jesus can sense or knows somehow that that is what he is thinking. But Jesus isn't meeting the man's expectations. Instead, he actually wants to challenge Simon. And so in verse 40 there, he says, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he says. Simon has just, said, just, just shown 
at least in his thinking where we're told that he's not happy with who Jesus is, yet he still shows enough respect, calls him rabbi, calls him teacher. And yet what Jesus has to say really is meant to challenge him because Jesus tells a mini parable. It's a fantastic little story uh, in just one verse there. Or two verses, sorry. And the story involves two people who owed a debt to a moneylender. One of them, we're told, owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Now, a denarius was, the, was, was a decent amount of money, I guess. It was the sort of standard wage for a, a labourer uh, for a day's work. And so it's, it's not a nothing to owe 50 denarii, denarii is a significant debt, maybe two months' wages. But, of course, to owe 500 denarii, well, we're talking a couple of years, aren't we? But Jesus says there in verse 42, well, neither of them had the money to pay him back. So they're both in the same situation in a sense. They're both in debt and unable to pay it back. What can they do? Well, what does the money lender do? He forgave the debts of both of them. We're not told told why the moneylender forgave the debts, just that's what happened. And how are they likely to feel about what the moneylender has done? Well, that's the exact question that Jesus asks when he says, now, which of them will love him more? Which of them will be more grateful? Which of them will be more thankful for what the moneylender has done? Simon seems to uh, be pretty clear on that. I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven, he said. Yes, says Jesus, you have judged correctly. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? The one who has the bigger debt will be much more grateful, will feel much more grateful. They should both be grateful if their debt has been forgiven. But the one who may feel more grateful is the one for whom it could mean their life. Although Simon is able to judge well with regard to the parable, the parable, of course, is meant to get Simon thinking about the reality of what's going on in the the room where he's invited Jesus to have dinner with him. Because what is is going on here is a, a live enactment of this parable. The woman who was, a, who was known to be a sinner is actually demonstrating the very parable that Jesus has just told. And so then Jesus turns from addressing Simon to address uh, the woman directly. We're not told her name, we don't know who she is, but Jesus is able to speak to her directly. But saying, first of all, to Simon, uh, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't put oil on my head, but she's poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Well, Jesus, first of all, reminds Simon that he hasn't really shown the hospitality that he should have shown to someone, even if you respect mildly, moderately. Walking around the dusty roads, it's only appropriate to offer somebody uh, water to wash their feet. Perhaps if you're really honouring them, you would, you would have uh, a servant clean their feet. Simon hasn't even done that for Jesus. He hasn't greeted him uh, with a kiss, which was a common way of greeting people, still is in the Middle East, isn't it? And he hasn't uh, given him oil to freshen up, which was often a thing. On on, On the other hand, the woman has washed his feet with her tears, has been kissing his feet, has poured perfume on them. 
What she has done is to display, by her public display of gratitude, that she really understands what Jesus has offered to her. What Jesus has given her is forgiveness of her sins. What that means is that somehow she has heard Jesus speaking before, she has perhaps met Jesus before, and he has talked to her as he's talked to many others about the fact that God's kingdom calls on people to repent of their sins, to turn away from their sins, but then to receive forgiveness. It was the message that John the Baptist had been preaching when he had been out in the wilderness. And Jesus and his disciples, no doubt, had been teaching the same thing. The kingdom of God is coming. Repent and believe so that you might have forgiveness of sins. And what Jesus is pointing out is that this woman really understands, perhaps because she is a notorious sinner, really understands what that forgiveness means. She understands the significance of it. She understands the weight that has been lifted from her, that she is no longer someone who who deserves the judgment of God, but in fact now has forgiveness and, and a new place in God's kingdom. And she is demonstrating her gratitude in in a way that shows just how that has gripped her, just how that has affected her. But Simon, on the other hand, he really doesn't seem to understand it. He has barely shown the respect that's due to Jesus. And he hasn't heard what Jesus has been saying about the need for forgiveness of sins. Even if somebody has a debt, a small debt that they can't pay, they should understand when the debt is forgiven that they owe gratitude to the one who forgives it. But it seems that Simon and perhaps the other religious people around him don't understand that they can't please God by their religion. There is no way that by their religious activity they can earn their way into heaven. They are sinners just as much as this woman. Their sin is just different. They need forgiveness as well. And so there ought to be an understanding of that, that Jesus has come to offer that forgiveness, to invite people into God's kingdom, and yet they are saying, by their lack of a gracious reception of Jesus, by their lack of showing gratitude that they haven't really received the forgiveness that he's come to offer. And so we see this incredible contrast. When Jesus does speak directly to the woman, there in verse 48, he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Her sins are forgiven. Perhaps she hasn't heard that before, but perhaps she has been hoping praying that she would hear those words because she knew how much she needed forgiveness. And now Jesus is able to assure her, her sins are forgiven. And so then at the very end of the passage, verse 50, he said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. She is not saved by doing good deeds. She is not saved by being religious on her religious practices. But she is saved through faith in him. That is what Jesus has come along to tell people. The kingdom of God is coming near and he's calling on everyone to come to him in faith so that they, so that we can have forgiveness of our sins. And sadly though, there are some who will hear that message and might even, as in the case of Simon, meet the saviour who has come to bring forgiveness and still not believe him, still not trust him, and still not have forgiveness of sins. That's incredibly sad, isn't it? That there are people who, they might do all sorts of religious acts. They might go on pilgrimages. They might spend days in prayer. They might do all sorts of good deeds, and yet 
they don't have faith in Jesus, they won't be saved. What in fact all those religious deeds are doing is just giving them a way to live with hard hearts that continue to reject God and continue to reject Jesus. And so no doubt they ask the question, as the other guests at this dinner party did there in verse 49, when they ask, who is this who even forgives sins? They aren't trusting Jesus. Remember that Jesus has already answered this question. Uh, back in, in chapter 5, Jesus was teaching and someone was, uh, a man was lowered through the roof right in front of him. And Jesus said to him, your sins are forgiven. And then the Pharisees then are muttering, who is this who says he can forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus looked at them and sort of in disbelief saying, well, which is, which is easier to say to this man, your sins are forgiven, or to say to him, get up and walk? It's actually easier to say one, that is, to say your sins are forgiven because it doesn't involve anything that's visible. But of course, it's actually harder to achieve because how can sins be forgiven? Only by the payment of the penalty that is deserved. And yet Jesus says, well, so that you may know that I have authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man, get up and walk. Jesus has demonstrated already that he has authority from God healing people, casting out demons, raising a man from the dead. He has authority from God. He certainly has the authority to forgive sins. And yet these religious people are questioning him because their hearts are hardened. They don't want to believe. They don't want to trust him. They don't want to follow him. And so in that room with a, a group of religious people who had invited Jesus to dinner so they could question him, so they could get to know him, so they could find out what he was on about. With a group of religious people and a notoriously sinful woman. The ones who go from there that night, as far as we know. Forgiven, or the one who goes from there forgiven, is the woman. Whereas the religious people seem to have hardened their hearts. And so they don't have forgiveness of their sins. The woman who knows how much she has been forgiven weeps and weeps so much that she can wash Jesus' feet. The others who, who should be appreciating what Jesus is offering them don't. Even if they appreciated that they had been forgiven, they didn't think they needed much forgiveness they would still at least show appreciation but they're not even doing that so friends i think the message of this passage is that we need to understand that we are all sinners who need forgiveness and that's what jesus came to bring he's been teaching about the coming of the kingdom of god but the fundamental thing about the kingdom of God is that we can only enter through faith in him when we receive the forgiveness of sins. That's the great thing that Jesus offers. And if we understand that that is the foundation of being members of the kingdom, being members of his family, then we will be so thankful. We'll always be thankful for what he has done for us in, in forgiving us. And we will show that gratitude. We will love God more because we understand how much we've been forgiven. It doesn't mean that you'll only really understand it if you've been in the notorious sinner category because we all need forgiveness. It's true that sometimes those people who really know what they've been forgiven of will love more. But I think if we stop and think about how much we all need forgiveness, then that will help us all to love God more. Can't hurt to reflect on that if it then motivates us to, to show our love to God and to others in the way that we respond. Of course, we respond 
by loving God and loving others, not so that we will somehow earn our way into heaven. That's not possible. We respond because, well, it's a response of gratitude and thanks in the way that the woman came and washed Jesus' feet and poured perfume on him to show her thanks. We seek to show thanks for what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, which is the forgiveness of sins and the eternal life that we can receive from him. So let's pray that we will be thankful to God. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that in your mercy, you did send Jesus into our world so that we could have forgiveness of sins. We thank you for his death on the cross. We thank you for his rising to new life. Father, we thank you that through him, all our sins can be forgiven, no matter what they are. And Father, we pray that you might help us to be grateful, not thinking that we have little to be forgiven, but understanding that we are sinners and that you forgive much. Father God, please help us then to respond in gratitude for what you have done for us, that we might honour you in all things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.